Chapter Sixteen of The Purple Land. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Purple Land by W. H. Hudson. Chapter Sixteen. When all they had left us, the charming senorita, in whose care I was well pleased to find myself, led me into a cool, spacious room, dimly lighted, scantily furnished, and with a floor of red tiles. It was a great relief to drop into a sofa there, for now I felt fatigued and suffered great pain from my arm. In a few moments I had the senorita, her mother, Doña Mercedes, and an old serving woman all round me. Gently drawing off my coat, they subjected my wounded arm to a minute examination, their compassionate fingertips, those of the lovely Dolores especially, feeling like a soft, cooling rain on the swollen, inflamed part, which had become quite purple. Ah, how barbarous of them to hurt you like that! A friend, too, of our general! exclaimed my beautiful nurse, which made me think that I had involuntarily become associated with the right political party in the state. They rubbed the arm with sweet oil, while the old servant brought in a bundle of rue from the garden, which, being bruised in a mortar, filled the room with a fresh aromatic smell. With this fragrant herb she made a cooling cataplasm. Having dressed my arm, they placed it in a sling. Then in place of my coat, a light Indian poncho was brought for me to wear. "'I think you're feverish,' said Doña Mercedes, feeling my pulse. "'We must send for the doctor. We have a doctor in our little town, a very skillful man.' "'I have little faith in doctors, senora,' I said, "'but great faith in women and grapes.' If you will give me a cluster from your vine to refresh my blood, I promise to be well very soon. Dolores laughed lightly and left the room, only to return in a few minutes with a dish full of ripe, purple clusters. They were delicious, and did seem to allay the fever I felt, which had probably been caused as much by angry passions as by the blow I had received. While I reclined luxuriously, sucking my grapes, the two ladies sat on each side of me, ostensibly fanning themselves, but only, I think, trying to make the air cooler for me. Very cool and pleasant they made it, certainly, but the gentle attentions of Dolores were at the same time such as might well create a subtler kind of fever in a man's veins, a malady not to be cured by fruit fans or phlebotomy who would not suffer blows for such compensation as this i said do not say such a thing exclaimed the senorita with wonderful animation have you not rendered a great service to our dear general to our beloved country if we had it in our power to give you everything your heart might desire it would be nothing nothing we must be your debtors forever. I smiled at her extravagant words, but they were very sweet to hear, none the less. Your ardent love of your country is a beautiful sentiment, I remarked somewhat indiscreetly. But is General Santa Coloma so necessary to its welfare? She looked offended and did not reply. You are a stranger in our country, senor, and do not quite understand these things, said the mother gently. Dolores must not forget that. You know nothing of the cruel wars we have seen, and how our enemies have conquered only by bringing in the foreigner to their aid. Ah, senor, the bloodshed, the proscriptions, the infamies, which they have brought on this land. But there is one man they have never yet succeeded in crushing. Always from boyhood he has been foremost in the fight, defying their bullets, and not to be corrupted by their Brazilian gold. Is it strange that he is so much to us, 
who have lost all our relations, and have suffered many persecutions, being deprived almost of the means of subsistence that hirelings and traders might be enriched with our property? To us in this house he is even more than to others. He was my husband's friend and his companion in arms. He has done us a thousand favors, and if he ever succeeds in overthrowing this infamous government, he will restore to us all the property we have lost. But I, Dimi, I cannot see deliverance yet. Mamita, do not say such a thing, exclaimed her daughter. Do you begin to despair now, when there is most reason to hope? Child, what can he do with this handful of ill-armed men? returned the mother sadly. He has bravely raised the standard, but the people do not flock to it. Ah, when this revolt is crushed, like so many others, we poor women will only have to lament for more friends slain and fresh persecutions. And here she covered her eyes with her handkerchief. Dolores tossed her head back and made a sudden gesture of impatience. Do you, then, expect to see a great army formed before the ink is dry on the general's proclamation? When Santa Coloma was a fugitive without a follower, you hoped. Now when he is with us, and actually preparing for a march on the capital, you begin to lose heart. I can't understand it. Doña Mercedes rose without replying, and left the room. The lovely enthusiast dropped her head on her hand and remained silent, taking no notice of me, a cloud of sorrow on her countenance. Senorita, I said, it is not necessary for you to remain longer here. Only tell me before going that you forgive me, for it makes me very unhappy to think that I have offended you. She turned to me with a very bright smile and gave me her hand. Ah, it is for you to forgive me for hastily taking offense at a light word, she said. I must not allow anything you say in future to spoil my gratitude. Do you know, I think you are one of those who like to laugh at most things, senor. No, let me call you Richard, and you shall call me Dolores, for we must remain friends always. Let us make a compact. Then it will be impossible for us to quarrel. You shall be free to doubt, question, laugh at everything, except one thing only, my faith in Santa Coloma. Yes, I will gladly make that agreement, I replied. It will be a new kind of paradise, and of the fruit of every tree I may eat except of this tree only. She laughed, gaily. I will now leave you, she said. You are suffering pain, and are very tired. Perhaps you will be able to sleep. While speaking, she brought a second cushion for my head, then left me, and before long I fell into a refreshing doze. I spent three days of enforced idleness at the Casablanca, as the house was called, before Santa Coloma returned, and after the rough experience I had undergone, during which I had subsisted on a flesh diet untempered by bread or vegetables. They were indeed like days spent in paradise to me. Then the general came back. I was sitting alone in the garden when he arrived, and, coming out to me, he greeted me warmly. I greatly feared from my previous experience of your impatience under restraint that you might have left us, he said kindly. I could not do that very well yet, without a horse to ride on, I returned. Well, I came here just now to say I wish to present you with a horse and saddle. The horse is standing at the gate now, I believe. But, if you are only waiting for a horse to leave us, I shall have to regret making you this present. Do not be in a hurry. We have yet many years to live in which to accomplish all you wish to do and to let us have the pleasure of your company a few days longer. Doña Mercedes and her daughter desire nothing better than to keep you with them. I promise not to run away immediately, 
a promise which was not hard to make. Then we went to inspect my horse, which proved to be a very fine bay, saddled with a dashing native ricado. Come with me and try him, he said. I am going to ride out to the Cerro Solo. The ride proved to be an extremely pleasant one, as I had not mounted a horse for some days, and had been longing to spice my idle hours with a little exhilarating motion. We went at a swinging gallop over the grassy plain, the general all the time discoursing freely of his plans and of the brilliant prospects awaiting all those timely wise individuals who should elect to link their fortunes with his at this early age of the campaign. The Cerro, three leagues distant from the village of El Molino, was a high, conical hill, standing quite alone and overlooking the country for a vast distance around. A few well-mounted men were stationed on the summit, keeping watch, and, after talking with them for a while, the general led me to a spot a hundred yards away, where there was a large mound of sand and stone, up which we made our horses climb with some difficulty. While we stood there he pointed out the conspicuous objects on the surface of the surrounding country, telling me the names of the estancias, rivers, distant hills, and other things. The whole country about us seemed very familiar to him. He ceased speaking at length, but continued gazing over the wide, sunlit prospect with a strange, far-off look on his face. Suddenly, Dropping the reins on the neck of his horse, he stretched out his arms towards the south, and began to murmur words which I could not catch, while an expression of mingled fury and exultation transformed his face. It passed away as suddenly as it came. Then he dismounted, and, stooping till his knee touched the ground, he kissed the rock before him, after which he sat down, and quietly invited me to do the same. Returning to the subject he had talked about during our ride, he began openly pressing me to join him in his march to Montevideo, which, he said, would begin almost immediately, and would infallibly result in a victory, after which he would reward me for the incalculable service I had rendered him in assisting him to escape from the Juez of Las Cuevas. These tempting offers, which would have fired my brain in other circumstances, the single state, I mean, I felt compelled to decline, though I did not state my real reasons for doing so. He shrugged his shoulders in the eloquent oriental fashion, remarking that it would not surprise him if I altered my resolution in a few days. Never, I mentally ejaculated. Then he recalled our first meeting again, spoke of Margarita, that marvelously beautiful child, asking if I had not thought it strange so fair a flower as that should have sprung from the homely stalk of a sweet potato. I answered that I had been surprised at first, but had ceased to believe that she was a child of Batata's, or any of his kin. He then offered to tell me Margarita's history, and I was not surprised to hear that he knew it. I owe you this, he said, in expiation of the somewhat offensive remarks I have addressed to you that day in reference to the girl. But you must remember that I was then only Marcos Marco, a peasant, and, having some slight knowledge of acting, it was only natural that my speech should be, as you find it in our common people, somewhat dry and ironical, Many years ago there lived in this country one Basilio de la Barca, a person of so noble a figure and countenance that to all those who beheld him he became the type of perfect beauty, so that a Basilio de la Barca came to be a proverbial expression in Montevidian society when anyone surpassingly handsome was spoken of. Though he had a gay, light-hearted disposition and loved social pleasures, he was not spoiled by the admiration his beauty excited. Simple-minded and modest he remained always, 
though perhaps not capable of any very strong passion, for though he won, without seeking it, the hearts of many fair women, he did not marry. He might have married some rich woman to improve his position had he been so minded, but in this, as in everything else in his life, Basilio seemed to be incapable of doing anything to advance his own fortunes. The de la Barcas had once possessed great wealth and land in the country, and I have heard, descended from an ancient noble family of Spain. During the long, disastrous wars this country has suffered, when it was conquered in turn by England, Portugal, Spain, Brazil, and the Argentines, the family became impoverished, and at last appeared to be dying out. The last of the de la Barcas was Basilio, and the evil destiny which had pursued all of that name for so many generations did not spare him. His whole life was a series of calamities. When young he entered the army, but in his first engagement he received a terrible wound which had disabled him for life, and compelled him to abandon the military career. After that he embarked all his little fortune in commerce, and was ruined by a dishonest partner. At length, when he had been reduced to great poverty, being then about forty years old, he married an old woman out of gratitude for the kindness she had shown to him, and with her he went to live on the sea-coast, several leagues east of the Cabo Santa Maria. Here, in a small rancho, in a lonely spot called Barranca del Peregrin, and with only a few sheep and cows to subsist on, he spent the remainder of his life. His wife, though old, bore him one child, a daughter, named Transita. They taught her nothing, for in all respects they lived like peasants and had forgotten the use of books. The situation was also wild and solitary, and they very seldom saw a strange face. Transita spent her childhood in rambling over the dunes on that lonely coast, with only wild flowers, birds, and the ocean waves for playmates. One day, her age being then about eleven, she was at her usual pastimes, her golden hair blowing in the wind, her short dress and bare legs wet with the spray, chasing the waves as they retired, or flying with merry shouts from them as they hurried back towards the shore flinging a cloud of foam over her retreating form, when a youth, a boy of fifteen, rode up and saw her there. He was hunting ostriches when, losing sight of his companions, and fighting himself near the ocean, he rode down to the shore to watch the tide coming in. Yes, I was that boy, Richard. You are quick in making conclusions. This he said not in reply to any remark I made, but to my thoughts, which he frequently guessed very aptly. The expression this exquisite child made on me, it would be impossible to convey in words. I had lived much in the capital, had been educated in our best college, was accustomed to associate with pretty women. I had also crossed the water and had seen all that was most worthy of admiration in the Argentine cities. And remember that with us a youth of fifteen already knows something of life. This child, playing with the waves, was like nothing I had seen before. I regarded her not as a mere human creature. She seemed more like some being from I know not what far-off celestial region which strayed to earth, just as a bird of white and azure plumage and unknown to our woods, sometimes appears, blown hither from a distant tropical country or island, filling those who see it with wonder and delight. Imagine, if you can, Margarita with her shining hair loose to the winds, swift and graceful in her motions as the waves she plays with, her sapphire eyes sparkling like sunlight on the waters, the tender tints of the seashell in her ever-changing countenance, with a laughter that seems to echo the wild melody of the sandpiper's note. Margarita has inherited the form, not the spirit, of the child Transita. 
she is an exquisite statue endowed with life. Transito, with lines equally graceful and colors just as perfect, had caught the spirit of the wind and sunshine, and was all freedom, motion, fire, a being half human, half angelic. I saw her only to love her, nor was it a common passion she inspired in me. I worshipped her, and longed to wear her on my bosom, but I shrank then, and for a long time after, from breathing the hot breath of love on so tender and heavenly a blossom. I went to her parents, and opened my heart to them. My family being well known to Basilio, I obtained his consent to visit their lonely rancho whenever I could, and I, on my part, promised not to speak of love to Transita till her sixteenth year. Three years after I had found Transita, I was ordered to a distant part of the country, for I was already in the army then, and, fearing that it would not be possible for me to visit them for a long time, I persuaded Basilio to let me speak to his daughter, who was now fourteen. She had by this time grown extremely fond of me, and she always looked forward with delight to my visits. When we would spend days together rambling along the shore, or seated on some cliff overlooking the sea, talking of the simple things she knew, and of that wonderful, faraway city life of which she was never tired of hearing. When I opened my heart to her, she was at first frightened at these new strange emotions I spoke of. Soon, however, I was made happy by seeing her fear grow less. In one day she ceased to be a child. The rich blood mantled her cheeks, to leave her the next moment pale and tremulous. Her tender lips were toying with the rim of the honeyed cup. Before I left her she had promised me her hand, and at parting even clung to me, with her beautiful eyes wet with tears. Three years passed before I returned to seek her. During that time I had sent scores of letters to Basilio, but received no reply. Twice I was wounded in fight, once very seriously. I was also a prisoner for several months. I made my escape at last, and, returning to Montevideo, obtained leave of absence. Then with heart of fire, with sweet anticipations, I sought that lonely sea-coast once more, only to find the weeds growing on the spot where Basilio's rancho had stood. In the neighborhood I learned that he had died two years before, and that after his death the widow had returned to Montevideo with Transita. After a long inquiry in that city, I discovered that she had not long survived her husband, and that a foreign senora had taken Transita away. No one knew whither. Her loss cast a great shadow on my life. Poignant grief cannot endure forever, nor for very long. Only the memory of grief endures. To this memory, which cannot fade, it is perhaps due that in one respect, at least, I am not like other men. I feel that I am incapable of passion for any woman. No. Not if a new Lucrezia Borgia were to come my way, scattering the fiery seeds of adoration upon all men, could they blossom to love in this arid heart. Since I lost Transita, I have had one thought, one love, one religion, and it is all told in one word. Patria. Years passed. I was captain in General Arib's army at the siege of my own city. One day a lad was captured in our lines, and came very near being put to death as a spy. He had come out from Montevideo, and was looking for me. He had been sent, he said, by Transita de la Barca, who was lying ill in the town and desired to speak to me before she died. I asked and obtained permission from a general, who had a strong personal friendship for me, to penetrate into the town. This was of course dangerous, and more so for me, perhaps, than it would have been for many of my brother officers, for I was very well known to the besieged. I succeeded, however, by persuading the officers of a French sloop of war, 
stationed in the harbour, to assist me. These foreigners at that time had friendly relations with the officers of both armies, and three of them had at one time visited our general to ask him to let them hunt ostriches in the interior. He passed them on to me, and, taking them to my own estancia, I entertained them and hunted with them for several days. For this hospitality they had expressed themselves very grateful, inviting me repeatedly to visit them on board, and also saying they would gladly do me any personal service in the town, which they visited constantly. I love not the French, believing them to be the most vain and egotistical, consequently the least chivalrous of mankind. But these officers were in my debt, and I resolved to ask them to help me. Under cover of night, I went on board their ship. I told them my story, and asked them to take me on shore with them disguised as one of themselves. With some difficulty they consented, and I was thus enabled next day to be in Montevideo with my long-lost transita. I found her lying on her bed, emaciated and white as death, on the last stage of some fatal pulmonary complaint. On the bed with her was a child between two and three years old, exceedingly beautiful like her mother, for one glance was sufficient to tell me it was Transita's child. Overcome with grief at finding her in this pitiful condition, I could only kneel at her side, pouring out the last tender tears that have fallen from these eyes. We Orientals are not tearless men, and I have wept since then, but only with rage and hatred. My last tears of tenderness were shed over unhappy, dying Transita. Briefly she told me her story. No letter from me had ever reached Basilio. It was supposed that I had fallen in battle, or that my heart had changed. When her mother lay dying in Montevideo, she was visited by a wealthy Argentine lady named Romero, who had heard of Transita's singular beauty, and wished to see her merely out of curiosity. She was so charmed with the girl that she offered to take her and bring her up as her own daughter. To this the mother, who was reduced to the greatest poverty and was dying, consented gladly. Transita was in this way taken to Buenos Aires, where she had masters to instruct her, and lived in great splendor. The novelty of this life charmed her for a while, the pleasures of a large city, and to the universal admiration her beauty excited, occupied her mind and made her happy. When she was seventeen, the Signora Romero bestowed her hand on a young man of that city, named Andrada, a wealthy person. He was a fashionable man, a gambler, and a sybarite. Having conceived a violent passion for the girl, he succeeded in winning over the Signora to aid his suit. Before marrying him, Transita told him frankly that she felt incapable of great affection for him. He cared nothing for that. He only wished, like the animal he was, to possess her for her beauty. Shortly after marrying her, he took her to Europe, knowing very well that a man with a full purse, and whose spirit is a compound of swine and goat, finds life pleasanter in Paris than in the Plata. In Paris, Transita lived a gay, but an unhappy life. Her husband's passion for her soon passed away, and was succeeded by neglect and insult. After three miserable years, he abandoned her altogether to live with another woman, and then, in broken health, she returned with her child to her own country. When she had been several months in Montevideo, she heard casually that I was still alive and in the besieging army, and anxious to impart her last wishes to a friend, had sent for me. Could you, my friend, divine the nature of that dying request Transito wished to make? Pointing to her child, she said, Do you not see that Margarita inherits that fatal gift of beauty which won for me a life of splendor, with extreme bitterness of heart and early death? Soon, before I die, perhaps, there will not be wanting some new Signora Romera to take charge of her, 
will at last sell her to some rich, cruel man, as I was sold. For how can her beauty remain long concealed? It was with very different views for her that I secretly left Paris and returned here. During all those miserable years I spent there, I thought more and more of my childhood on that lonely coast, until, when I fell ill, I resolved to go back there to spend my last days on that beloved spot where I had been so happy. It was my intention to find some peasant family there who would be willing to take Margarita and bring her up as a peasant's child, with no knowledge of her father's position and of the life men live in towns. The siege of my failing health made it impossible for me to carry out that plan. I must die here, dear friend, and never see that lonely coast where we have sat together so often watching the waves. But I think only of poor little Margarita now, who will soon be motherless. Will you not help me to save her? Promise me that you will take her away to some distant place, where she will be brought up as a peasant's child, where her father will never find her. If you can promise me this, I will resign her to you now, and face death without even the sad consolation of seeing her by me to the last. I promise to carry out her wishes, and also to see the child as often as circumstances will allow, and when she grew up to find her a good husband. But I would not deprive her of the child then. I told her that if she died, Margarita would be conveyed to the French ship in the harbor, and afterwards to me, and that I knew where to place her with a good-hearted, simple peasant who loves me, and would obey my wishes in all things. She was satisfied, and I left her to make the necessary arrangements to carry out my plans. A few weeks later, Trancita expired, and the child was brought to me. I then sent her to the Batata's house, where, ignorant of the secret of her birth, she has been brought up as her mother wished her to be. May she never, like the unhappy Transita, fall into the power of a ravening beast in man's shape. Amen, I exclaimed. But surely, if this child will be entitled to a fortune some day, it will only be right that she should have it. We do not worship gold in this country, he replied. With us the poor are just as happy as the rich, their wants are so few, and easily satisfied. It would be too much to say that I love the child more than I love anyone else. I think only of Transito's wishes. That for me is the only right in the matter. Had I failed to carry them out to the letter, then I should have suffered a great remorse. Possibly I may encounter Andrada some day, and pass my sword through his body. That would give me no remorse. After some moments of silence, he looked up and said, Richard, you admired and loved that beautiful girl when you first saw her. Listen, if you wish it, you shall have her for a wife. She is simple-minded, ignorant of the world, affectionate, and where she is told to love, she will love. But that those people will obey my wishes in everything. I shook my head smiling somewhat sorrowfully when I thought that the events of the last few days had already half obliterated Margarita's fair image from my mind. This unexpected proposition had, moreover, forced on me, with a startling suddenness, the fact that by once performing the act of marriage, a man has forever used up the most glorious privilege of his sex. Of course, I mean in countries where he is only allowed to have one wife. It was no longer in my power to say to any woman, however charming I might find her, Be my wife. But I did not explain all this to the general. Ah, uh, you are thinking of conditions, said he. There will be none. No, you have guessed wrong for once, I returned. The girl is all you say. I have never seen a being more beautiful and I have never heard a more romantic story than the one you have just told me about her birth. I can only echo your prayer 
that she may not suffer as her mother did. In name she is not Adela Barca, and perhaps destiny will spare her on that account. He glanced keenly at me and smiled. Perhaps you are thinking more of Dolores than of Margarita just now, he said. Let me warn you of your danger there, my young friend. She has already promised to another. Absurdly unreasonable as it may seem, I felt a jealous pang at that information. But then, of course, we are not reasonable beings, whatever the philosophers say. I laughed, not very gaily, I must confess, and answered that there was no need to warn me, as Dolores would never be more to me than a very dear friend. Even then, I did not tell him that I was a married man, for often, in the Banda Oriental, I did not quite seem to know how to mix my truth and lies, and so preferred to hold my tongue. In this instance, as subsequent events proved, I held it not wisely, but too well. The open man, with no secrets from the world, often enough escapes disasters which overtake your very discreet person, who acts on the old adage that speech was given to us to conceal our thoughts. End of chapter 16「Chapter 17 With a horse to travel on, and my arm so much better that the sling supporting it was worn rather for ornament than use, there was nothing except that promise not to run away immediately to detain me longer in the pleasant retreat of the Casa Blanca. Nothing, that is, had I been a man of gutta percha or cast iron being only a creature of clay, very impressionable clay as it happened. I could not persuade myself that I was quite well enough to start on that long ride over a disturbed country. Besides, my absence from Montevideo had already lasted so long that a few days more could not make much difference one way or the other. Thus, it came to pass that I still stayed on, enjoying the society of my new friends, while every day, every hour, in fact, I felt less able to endure the thought of tearing myself away from Dolores. Much of my time was spent in the pleasant orchard adjoining the house. Here, growing in picturesque irregularity, were fifty or sixty old peach, nectarine, apricot, plum, and cherry trees, their balls double the thickness of a man's thigh. They had never been disfigured by the pruner's knife or saw, and their enormous size and rough bark, overgrown with grey lichen, gave them an appearance of great antiquity. All about the ground, tangled together in a pretty confusion, flourished many of those dear, familiar, old-world garden flowers that spring up round the white man's dwelling in all temperate regions of the earth. Here were immemorial wallflowers, stocks, and marigolds, tall hollyhock, gay poppy, brilliant bachelor's button, also half hid amongst the grass, pansy, and forget-me-not. The larkspur, red, white, and blue, flaunted everywhere, and here, too, was the unforgotten sweet William, looking bright and velvety as of yore, yet 
in spite of its brightness and stiff green collar, still wearing the old shamefaced expression, as if it felt a little ashamed of its own pretty name. These flowers were not cultivated, but grew spontaneously from the seed they shed year by year on the ground, the gardener doing nothing for them beyond keeping the weeds down and bestowing a little water in hot weather. The solstitial heats being now over, during which European garden flowers cease to bloom for a season, they were again in gayest livery to welcome the long second spring of autumn, lasting from February to May. At the farther end of this wilderness of flowers and fruit trees was an aloe hedge, covering a width of twenty to thirty yards with its enormous, disorderly, stave-like leaves. This hedge was like a strip of wild nature placed alongside of a plot of man's improved nature, and here, like snakes hunted from the open, the weeds and wildings, which were not permitted to mix with the flowers, had taken refuge. Protected by that rude bastion of spikes, the hemlock opened feathery clusters of dark leaves and whitish umbels wherever it could reach up to the sunshine. There also grew the nightshade with other solanaceous weeds, bearing little clusters of green and purple berries, wild oats, foxtail grass, and nettles. The hedge gave them shelter, but no moisture, so that all these weeds and grasses had a somewhat forlorn and starved appearance, climbing up with long, stringy stems among the powerful aloes. The hedge was also rich in animal life. There dwelt mice, cavies, and elusive little lizards. Crickets sang all day long under it, while in every open space the green apeiras spread their geometric webs. Being rich in spiders, it was a favorite hunting ground of those insect desperados, the mason wasps that flew about loudly buzzing in their splendid gold and scarlet uniform. There were also many little shy birds here, and my favorite was the wren, for in its appearance and its scolding, jerky, gesticulating ways, it is precisely like our house wren, though it has a richer and more powerful song than the English bird. On the other side of the hedge was the potrero, or paddock, where a milch cow with two or three horses were kept. The manservant, whose name was Nepomucino, presided over orchard and paddock, also to some extent over the entire establishment. Nepomucino was a pure negro, a little old, round-headed, blear-eyed man, about five feet four in height, the short, lumpy wool on his head quite gray, slow in speech and movements, his old black or chocolate-colored fingers, all crooked, stiff-jointed, and pointing spontaneously in different directions. I have never seen anything in the human subject to equal the dignity of Nepomucino the profound gravity of his bearing and expression, forcibly reminding one of an owl. Apparently, he had come to look upon himself as the sole head and master of the establishment, and the sense of responsibility had more than steadied him. The negrine propensity to frequent explosions of inconsequent laughter was not, of course, to be expected in such a sober-minded person, but he was, I think, a little too sedate for a black, for, although his face would shine on warm days like polished ebony, it did not smile. Everyone in the house conspired to keep up the fiction of Nepomucino's importance. 
they had in fact conspired so long and so well that it had very nearly ceased to be a fiction everybody addressed him with grave respect not a syllable of his long name was ever omitted what the consequences of calling him nepo or sino or senito the affectionate diminutive would have been i am unable to say since i never had the courage to try the experiment it often amused me to hear doña mercedes calling to him from the house and throwing the whole emphasis on the last syllable in a long piercing crescendo nepomucino sometimes when i sat in the orchard he would come and placing himself before me discourse gravely about things in general clipping his words and substituting r for l in a negro fashion which made it hard for me to repress a smile after winding up with a few appropriate moral reflections he would finish with the remark for though i am brack on the surface senor my heart is white and then he would impressively lay one of his old crooked fingers on the part where the physiological curiosity was supposed to be he did not like being told to perform menial offices preferring to anticipate all requests of that kind and do whatever was necessary by stealth sometimes i would forget this peculiarity of the old black and tell him that i wanted him to polish my boots he would ignore the request altogether and talk for a few minutes of political matters or on the uncertainty of all things mundane and by and by glancing at my boots would remark incidentally that they required polishing offering somewhat ostentatiously to have them done for me nothing would make him admit that he did these things himself once i tried to amuse dolores by mimicking his speech to her but quickly she silenced me saying that she loved nepomucino too well to allow even her best friend to laugh at him he had been born when blacks were slaves in the service of her family had carried her in his arms when she was an infant and had seen all the male members of the house of zelaya swept away in the wars of reds and whites but in the days of their adversity his faithful dog-like affection had never failed them it was beautiful to see her manner towards him if she wanted a rose for her hair or dress she would not pluck it herself or allow me to get it for her but nepomucino must be asked to get it then every day she would find time to sit down in the garden by his side to tell him all the news of the village and of the country at large discuss the position of affairs with him and ask his advice about everything in the house indoors or out i generally had dolores for a companion and i could certainly not have had a more charming one the civil war though the little splutter on the ye scarcely deserved that name yet was her unfailing theme she was never weary of singing her hero santa coloma's praises his dauntless courage and patience in defeat his strange romantic adventures the innumerable disguises and stratagems he had resorted to when going about in his own country where a price was set on his head ever labouring to infuse fresh valour into his beaten disheartened followers that the governing party had any right to be in power or possessed any virtue of any kind or were in fact anything but an incubus and a curse to the banda oriental she would not for one moment admit to her mind her country always appeared like andromeda bound on her rock and left weeping and desolate to be a prey to the abhorred 
Colorado monster, while ever to the deliverance of this lovely being came her glorious Perseus, swift as the winds of heaven, the lightnings of terrible vengeance flashing from his eyes, the might of the immortals in his strong right arm. Often she tried to persuade me to join this romantic adventurer, and it was hard, very hard, to resist her eloquent appeals, and perhaps it grew harder every day as the influence of her passionate beauty strengthened itself upon my heart. Invariably, I took refuge in the argument that I was a foreigner, that I loved my country with an ardor equal to hers, and that by taking arms in the Banda Oriental I should at once divest myself of all an Englishman's rights and privileges. She scarcely had patience to listen to this argument. It seemed so trivial to her, and when she demanded other, better reasons, I had none to offer. I dare not quote to her the words of sulky Achilles. The distant Trojans never injured me, for that argument would have sounded even weaker to her than the former one. She had never read Homer in any language, of course, but she would have quickly made me tell her about Achilles, and when the end came, with miserable Hector dragged thrice round the walls of besieged Troy. Montevideo was called modern Troy, she knew. Then she would have turned my argument against me, and bidden me go and serve the Uruguayan president as Achilles served Hector. Seeing me silent, she would turn indignantly away, only for a moment, however. The bright smile would quickly return, and she would exclaim, No, no, Richard, I shall not forget my promise, though I sometimes think you try to make me do so. It was noon. The house was quiet, for Doña Mercedes, had retired after breakfast to take her unfailing siesta, leaving us to our conversation. In that spacious, cool room, where I had first reposed in the house, I was lying on the sofa, smoking a cigarette. Dolores, seating herself near me with her guitar, said, Now let me play and sing you to sleep with something very soft but the more she played and sang, the further was I from unneeded slumber. What? Not sleeping yet, Richard, she would say, with a little laugh after each song. Not yet, Dolores, I would reply, pretending to get drowsy, but my eyes are getting heavy now. One more song will send me to the region of dreams. Sing me that sweet favorite. Desde aquel doloroso momento. At length, finding that my sleepiness was all pretense, she refused to sing any more, and presently we drifted once more into the old subject. Ah, yes, she replied to that argument about my nationality, which was my only shield. I have always been taught to believe foreigners a cold, practical, calculating kind of people so different from us you never seem to me like a foreigner ah richard why will you make me remember that you are not one of us tell me dear friend if a beautiful woman cried out to you to deliver her from some great misfortune or danger would you stop to ask her nationality before going to her rescue no dolores you know that if you, for instance, were in distress or danger, I would fly to your side and risk my life to save you. I believe you, Richard, but tell me, is it less noble to help a suffering people, cruelly oppressed by wicked men, who have succeeded by crimes and treachery and foreign aid in climbing into power? Will you tell me that no Englishman has drawn a sword in a cause like that. Oh, friend, is not my mother country more beautiful and worthy to be helped than any woman? Has not God given her spiritual eyes that shed tears 
and look for comfort, lips sweeter than any woman's lips, that cry bitterly every day for deliverance. Can you look on the blue skies above you, and walk on the green grass where the white and purple flowers smile up at you, and be deaf and blind to her beauty and to her great need? Oh, no, no, it is impossible. Ah, if you were a man, Dolores, what a flame you would kindle in the hearts of your countrymen. Yes, if I were a man, she exclaimed, starting to her feet, then I should serve my country, not with words only, then I would strike and bleed for her. How willingly, being only a weak woman, I would give my heart's blood to win one arm to aid in the sacred cause. She stood before me with flashing eyes, her face glowing with enthusiasm. Then I also rose to my feet, and took her hands in mine, for I was intoxicated with her loveliness, and almost ready to throw all restraints to the winds. Dolores, I said, are not your words extravagant? Shall I test their sincerity? Tell me, would you give even as much as one kiss with your sweet lips? to win a strong arm for your country. She turned crimson and cast her eyes down, then, quickly recovering herself, answered, What do your words mean? Speak plainly, Richard. I cannot speak plainer, Dolores. Forgive me if I have offended once more. Your beauty and grace and eloquence have made me forget myself. Her hands were moist and trembling in mine. Still, she did not withdraw them. No, I am not offended, she returned in a strangely low tone. Put me to the test, Richard. Do you wish me to understand clearly that for such a favor as that you would join us? I cannot say, I replied, still endeavoring to be prudent, though my heart was on fire and my words when I spoke seemed to choke me. But, Dolores, if you would shed your blood to win one strong arm, will you think it too much to bestow the favor I spoke of in the hope of winning an arm? She was silent. Then, drawing her closer, I touched her lips with mine. But who was ever satisfied with that one touch on the lips for which the heart has craved? It was like contact with a strange celestial fire that instantly kindled my love to madness. Again and yet again I kissed her. I pressed her lips till they were dry and burned like fire, then kissed cheek, forehead, hair, and casting my arms about her, strained her to my breast in a long, passionate embrace. Then the violence of the paroxysm was over and with a pang I released her. She trembled. Her face was whiter than alabaster, and covering it with her hands, she sank down on the sofa. I sat down beside her, and drew her head down on my breast, but we remained silent. Only our hearts were beating very fast. Presently she disengaged herself, and without bestowing one glance on me, rose and left the room. Before long, I began to blame myself bitterly for this imprudent outburst. I dared not hope to continue longer on the old, familiar footing. So high-spirited and sensitive a woman as Dolores would not easily be brought to forget or forgive my conduct. She had not repelled me. She had even tacitly consented to that one first kiss and was therefore partly to blame herself. But her extreme pallor, her silence, and cold manner had plainly shown me that I had wounded her. My passion had overcome me, and I felt that I had compromised myself. For that one first kiss I had all but promised to do a certain thing, and not to do it now seemed very dishonorable much as I shrank from joining the Blanco rebels. 
I had proposed the thing myself. She had silently consented to the stipulation. I had taken my kiss, and much more, and having now had my delirious, evanescent joy, I could not endure the thought of meanly skulking off without paying the price. I went out full of trouble, and paced up and down in the orchard for two or three hours, hoping that Dolores might come to me there, but I saw no more of her that day. At dinner, Doña Mercedes was excessively affable, showing clearly that she was not in her daughter's confidence. She informed me, simple soul, that Dolores was suffering from a grievous headache, caused by taking a glass of claret at breakfast after eating a slice of watermelon, an imprudence against which she did not omit to caution me. Lying awake that night, for the thought that I had pained and offended Dolores made it impossible for me to sleep, I resolved to join Santa Coloma immediately. That act alone would salve my conscience, and I only hoped that it would serve to win back the friendship and esteem of the woman I had learned to love so well. I had no sooner determined on taking this step than I began to see so many advantages in it that it seemed strange I had not taken it before. But we lose half our opportunities in life through too much caution. A few more days of adventure, all the pleasanter for being spiced with danger, and I would be once more in Montevideo with a host of great and grateful friends to start me in some career in the country. Yes, I said to myself, becoming enthusiastic, once this oppressive, scandalous, and besotted Colorado party is swept with bullet and steel out of the country, as of course it will be, I shall go to Santa Coloma to lay down my sword, resuming by that act my own nationality, and as sole reward of my chivalrous conduct in aiding the rebellion, ask for his interest in getting me placed, say, at the head of some large estancia in the interior. There, possibly on one of his own establishments, I shall be in my element and happy hunting ostriches, eating carne con cuero, possessing a tropilla of twenty cream-colored horses for my private use, and building up a modest fortune out of hides, horns, tallow, and other native products. At break of day, I rose and saddled my horse. Then, finding the dignified Nepomucino, who was the early bird, blackbird of the establishment, told him to inform his mistress that I was going to spend a day with General Santa Coloma. After taking a mate from the old fellow, I mounted and galloped out of the village of Molino. Arrived at the camp, which had been moved to a distance of four or five miles from El Molino, I found Santa Coloma just ready to mount his horse to start on an expedition to a small town eight or nine leagues distant. He at once asked me to go with him, and remarked that he was very much pleased, though not surprised, at my having changed my mind about joining him. We did not return till late in the evening, and the whole of the following day was spent in monotonous cavalry exercises. I then went to the general, and requested permission to visit the Casablanca, to bid adieu to my friends there. He informed me that he intended going to El Molino the next morning himself, and would take me with him. The first thing he did on our arrival at the village was to send me to the principal storekeeper in the place, a man who had faith in the Blanco leader, and was rapidly disposing of a large stock of goods at a splendid profit, receiving in payment sundry slips of paper signed by Santa Coloma. This good fellow, 
who mixed politics with business, provided me with a complete and much-needed outfit, which included a broadcloth suit of clothes, soft brown hat rather broad in the brim, long riding boots, and poncho. Going back to the official building or headquarters in the plaza, I received my sword, which did not harmonize very well with the civilian costume I wore, but I was no worse off in this respect than forty-nine out of every fifty men in our little army. In the afternoon we went together to see the ladies, and the general had a very hearty welcome from both of them, as I also had from Doña Mercedes, while Dolores received me with the utmost indifference, expressing no pleasure or surprise at seeing me wearing a sword in the cause which she had professed to have so much at heart. This was a sore disappointment, and I was also nettled at her treatment of me. After dinner, over which we sat talking some time, the general left us, telling me before doing so to join him in the plaza at five o'clock next morning. I then tried to get an opportunity of speaking to Dolores alone, but she studiously avoided me, and in the evening there were several visitors, ladies from the town, with three or four officers from the camp, and dancing and singing were kept up till towards midnight. Finding that I could not speak to her, and anxious about my appointment at five in the morning, I at length retired sorrowful and baffled to my apartment. Without undressing, I threw myself on my bed, and being very much fatigued with so much riding about, I soon fell asleep. When I woke, the brilliant light of the moon, shining in at open window and door, made me fancy it was already daylight, and I quickly sprang up. I had no means of telling the time, except by going into the large living room, where there was an old eight-day clock. Making my way thither, I was amazed to see, on entering it, Dolores, in her white dress, sitting beside the open window, in a dejected attitude. She started and rose up when I entered. The extreme pallor of her face, heightened by contrast with her long, raven-black hair hanging unbound on her shoulders. Dolores, do I find you here at this hour? I exclaimed. Yes, she returned coldly, sitting down again. Do you think it very strange, Richard? Pardon me for disturbing you, I said. I came here to find out the time from your clock. It is two o'clock. Is that all you came for? Did you imagine I could retire to sleep without first knowing what your motive was in returning to this house? Have you then forgotten everything? I came to her and sat down by the window before speaking. No, Dolores, I said. Had I forgotten, you would not have seen me here enlisted in a cause which I looked on only as your cause. Ah, uh, then you have honoured the Casa Blanca with this visit not to speak to me that you considered unnecessary, but merely to exhibit yourself wearing a sword. I was stung by the extreme bitterness of her tone. You are unjust to me, I said, since that fatal moment when my passion overcame me. I have not ceased thinking of you, grieving that I had offended you. No. I did not come to exhibit my sword, which is not worn for ornament. I came only to speak to you, Dolores, and you purposely avoided me. Not without reason, she retorted quickly. Did I not sit quietly by you, after you had acted in that way towards me, waiting for you to speak, to explain, and you were silent? Well, senor, I am here now, waiting again. This, then, is what I have to say, I replied. After what passed, I considered myself bound in honor 
to join your cause, Dolores. What more can I say except to implore your forgiveness? Believe me, dear friend, in that moment of passion I forgot everything, forgot that I, forgot that your hand was already given to another. Given to another? What do you mean, Richard? Who told you that? General Santa Coloma. The general? What right has he to occupy himself with my affairs? This is a matter that concerns myself only, and it is presumption on his part to interfere in it. Do you speak in that tone of your hero, Dolores? Remember that he only warned me of my danger out of pure friendship, but his warning was thrown away. My unhappy passion, the sight of your loveliness, your own incautious words, were too much for my heart. She dropped her face on her hands and remained silent. I have suffered for my fault and must suffer more. Will you not say you forgive me, Dolores? I said, offering my hand. She took it, but continued silent. Say, dearest friend, that you forgive me, that we part, friends. Oh, Richard, must we part then? she murmured. Yes, now, Dolores, for before you are up, I must be on horseback and on my way to join the troops. The march to Montevideo will probably commence almost immediately. Oh, I cannot bear it, she suddenly exclaimed, taking my hands in both hers. Let me open my heart to you now. Forgive me, Richard, for being so angry with you, but I did not know the general had said such a thing. Believe me, he imagines more than he knows. When you took me in your arms and held me against your breast, it was a revelation to me. I cannot love or give my hand to any other man. You are everything in the world to me now, Richard. Must you leave me to mingle in this cruel civil strife in which all my dearest friends and relations have perished? She had had her revelation. I now had mine and it was an exceedingly bitter one. I trembled at the thought of confessing my secret to her, now when she had so unmistakably responded to the passion I had insanely revealed. Suddenly she raised her dark, luminous eyes to mine, anger and shame struggling for mastery on her pale face. Speak, Richard, she exclaimed. Your silence at this moment is an insult to me. For God's sake, have mercy on me, Dolores, I said. I am not free. I have a wife. For some moments she sat staring fixedly at me. Then, flinging my hand from her, covered her face. Presently she uncovered it again, for shame was overcome and cast out by anger. She rose and stood up before me, her face very white. You have a wife, a wife whose existence you concealed from me till this moment, she said. Now you ask for mercy when your secret has been wrung from you. Married, and you have dared to take me in your arms, to excuse yourself afterwards with the plea of passion. Passion, do you know what it means, traitor? Ah, no, a breast like yours cannot know any great or generous emotion. Would you have dared show your face to me again, had you been capable of shame even? And you judged my heart as shallow as your own, and after treating me in that way, thought to win my forgiveness and admiration even, by parading before me with a sword. Leave me, I can feel nothing but contempt for you. Go, you are a disgrace to the cause you have espoused. I had sat, utterly crushed and humiliated, not daring even to raise my sight to her face, for I felt that my own unspeakable weakness and folly had brought this tempest upon me. 
but there is a limit to patience, even in the most submissive mood, and when that was overpassed, then my anger blazed out all the more hotly, for the penitential meekness I had preserved during the whole interview. Her words from the first had fallen like whip-cuts, making me writhe with the pain they inflicted, but that last taunt stung me beyond endurance. I, an Englishman, to be told that I was a disgrace to the Blanco cause, which I had joined, in spite of my better judgment, purely out of my romantic devotion to this very woman. I, too, was now upon my feet, and there, face to face, we stood for some moments, silent and trembling. At length I found my speech. This, I cried, from the woman who was ready yesterday to shed her heart's blood to win one strong arm for her country. I have renounced everything, allied myself with abhorred robbers and cutthroats, only to learn that her one desire is everything to her, her divine, beautiful country, nothing. I wish that a man had spoken those words to me, Dolores, so that I might have put this sword you speak of to one good use before breaking it and flinging it from me like the vile thing it is. Would to God the earth would open and swallow up this land for ever, though I sank down into hell with it for the detestable crime of taking part in its pirate wars. She stood perfectly still, gazing at me with widely dilated eyes, a new expression coming into her face. Then, when I paused for her to speak, expecting only a fresh outburst of scorn and bitterness, a strange, sorrowful smile flitted over her lips, and coming close to me, she placed her hand on my shoulder. Oh, she said, what a strength of passion you are capable of. Forgive me, Richard, for I have forgiven you. Ah, we were made for each other, and it can never, never be. She dropped her head dejectedly on my shoulder. My anger vanished at those sad words. Love only remained. Love mingled with profoundest compassion and remorse for the pain I had inflicted. Supporting her with my arm, I tenderly stroked her dark hair, and, stooping, pressed my lips against it. Do you love me so much, Dolores, I said, enough even to forgive the cruel, bitter words I have just spoken. Oh, I was mad, mad to say such things to you, and shall repent it all my life long. How cruelly have I wounded you with my love and my anger. Tell me, dearest Dolores, can you forgive me? Yes, Richard, everything. Is there any word you can speak, any deed you can do, and I not forgive it? Does your wife love you like that? Can you love her as you love me? How cruel destiny is to us! Ah, my beloved country, I was ready to shed my blood for you, just to win one strong arm to fight for you, but I did not dream that this would be the sacrifice required of me. Look, it will soon be time for you to go. We cannot sleep now, Richard. Sit down here with me, and let us spend this last hour together with my hand in yours, for we shall never, never, never meet again. And so, sitting there hand in hand, we waited for the dawn, speaking many sad and tender words to one another. And at last, when we parted, I held her once more, unresisting, to my breast, thinking, as she did, that our separation would be an eternal one. End of chapter 17
Chapter Eighteen of the Purple Land. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rick Vina. The Purple Land by W. H. Hudson. Chapter Eighteen About the stirring events of the succeeding days I have little to relate, and no reader who has suffered the malady of love in its acutest form will wonder at it. During those days I mixed with a crowd of adventurers, returned exiles, criminals, and malcontents, every one of them worth studying. The daylight hours were passed in cavalry exercises or in long expeditions about the country, while every evening beside the camp-fire romantic tales enough to fill a volume were told in my hearing. But the image of Dolores was ever before my mind, so that all this crowded period, lasting nine or ten days, passed before me like a phantasmagoria or an uneasy dream, leaving only a very confused impression on my brain. I not only grieved for the sorrow I had occasioned her, but mourned also that my own heart had so terribly betrayed me, so that for the moment the beautiful girl I had persuaded to fly from home and parents, promising her my undying affection, had ceased to be what she had been, so great was this new inconvenient passion. The general had offered me a commission in his tatterdemalion gathering, but, as I had no knowledge of military matters, I had prudently declined it, only requesting, as a special favour, that I might be employed constantly on the expeditions he sent out over the surrounding country to beat up recruits seize arms, cattle, and horses, and to depose the little local authorities in the villages, putting creatures of his own in their places. This request had been granted, so that morning, noon, and night I was generally in the saddle. One evening I was in the camp, seated beside a large fire, and gloomily staring into the flames, when the other men who were occupied playing cards or sipping maté, hastily rose to their feet, making the salute. Then I saw the general standing near, gazing fixedly at me. Motioning to the men to resume their cards, he sat down by my side. "'What is the matter with you?' he said. "'I have noticed that you are like a different person since you joined us. Do you regret that step? No, I answered, and then was silent, not knowing what more to say. He looked searchingly at me. Doubtless some suspicion of the truth was in his mind, for he had gone to the Casa Blanca with me, and it was scarcely likely that his keen eyes had failed to notice the cold reception Dolores gave me on that occasion. He did not, however, touch on that matter. Tell me, he said at length, what can I do for you? I laughed. What can you do except to take me to Montevideo, I replied. Why do you say that? He returned quickly. We are not merely friends now, as we were before I joined you, I said. You are my general. I am simply one of your men. The friendship remains just the same, Richard. Let me know frankly what you think of this campaign, since you have now suddenly turned the current of the conversation in that direction. There was a slight sting in the concluding words, but I had, perhaps, deserved it. Since you bid me speak, I said, I, for one, feel very much disappointed at the little progress we are making. It seems to me that before you are in a position to strike, the enthusiasm and courage of your people will have vanished. 
you cannot get anything like a decent army together, and the few men you have are badly armed and undisciplined. Is it not plain that a march to Montevideo in these circumstances is impossible, that you will be obliged to retire into the remote and difficult places to carry on a guerrilla war? No, he returned. There is to be no guerrilla war. The Colorados made the Orientals sick of it when that arch traitor and chief of cutthroats, General Rivera, desolated the banda for ten years. We must ride on to Montevideo soon. As for the character of my force, that is a matter it would perhaps be useless to discuss, my young friend. If I could import a well-equipped and disciplined army from Europe to do my fighting, I should do so. The oriental farmer, unable to send to England for a threshing machine, is obliged to go out and gather his wild mares from the plain to tread out his wheat. And I, in like manner, having only a few scattered ranchos to draw my soldiers from, must be satisfied to do what I can with them. And now tell me, are you anxious to see something done at once? A fight, for instance, in which we might possibly be the losers? Yes, that would be better than standing still. If you are strong, the best thing you can do is to show your strength. He laughed. Richard, you were made for an oriental, he said. Only nature at your birth dropped you down in the wrong country. You are brave to rashness, abhor restraint, love women, and have a light heart. The Castilian gravity you have recently assumed is, I fancy, only a passing mood. Your words are highly complimentary and fill me with pride, I answered, but I scarcely see their connection with the subject of our conversation. There is a connection, nevertheless, he returned pleasantly. Though you refuse a commission from me, I am so convinced that you are in heart one of us, that I will take you into my confidence and tell you something known to only half a dozen trusted individuals here. You rightly say that if we have strength, we must show it to the country. That is what we are now about to do. A cavalry force has been sent against us, and we shall engage it before two days are over. As far as I know, the forces will be pretty evenly balanced, though our enemies will, of course, be better armed. We shall choose our own ground, and, should they attack us tired with a long march, or if there should be any disaffection amongst them, the victory will be ours, and after that every blanco sword in the banda will be unsheathed in our cause. I need not repeat to you that in the hour of my triumph, if it ever comes, I shall not forget my debt to you. My wish is to bind you body and heart to this oriental country it is however possible that i may suffer defeat and if in two days time we are all scattered to the winds let me advise you what to do do not attempt to return immediately to montevideo as that might be dangerous make your way by minas to the southern coast and when you reach the department of rocha inquire for the little settlement of Lomas de Rocha, a village three leagues west of the lake. You will find there a storekeeper, one Florentino Blanco, a Blanco in heart as well. Tell him I sent you to him, and ask him to procure you an English passport from the capital, after which it will be safe for you to travel to Montevideo. Should you ever be identified as a follower of mine, you can invent some story to account for your presence in my force. When I remember that botanical lecture you once delivered, 
also some other matters i am convinced that you are not devoid of imagination after giving some further kind advice he bade me good night leaving me with a strangely unpleasant conviction in my mind that we had changed characters for the nonce and that i had bungled as much in my new part as i had formerly done in my old he had been sincerity itself while i picking up the discarded mask had tied it on probably upside down for it made me feel excessively uncomfortable during our interview to make matters worse i was also sure that it had quite failed to hide my countenance and that he knew as well as i knew myself the real cause of the change he had noticed in me these disagreeable reflections did not trouble me long and then i began to feel considerable excitement at the prospect of a brush with the government troops my thoughts kept me awake most of the night still next morning when the trumpet sounded its shrill reveil close at hand i rose quickly and in a much more cheerful mood than i had known of late i began to feel that i was getting the better of that insane passion for dolores which had made us both so unhappy and when we were once more in the saddle the castilian gravity to which the general had satirically alluded had pretty well vanished no expeditions were sent out that day after we had marched about twelve or thirteen miles eastward and nearer to the immense range of the cuchilla grande we encamped and after the midday meal spent the afternoon in cavalry exercises on the next day happened the great event for which we had been preparing and i am positive that with the wretched material he commanded no man could have done more than santa coloma though alas all his efforts ended in disaster alas i say not because i took even then any very serious interest in oriental politics but because it would have been greatly to my advantage if things had turned out differently besides a great many poor devils who had been an unconscionable time out in the cold would have come into power and the rascally colorados sent away in their turn to eat the bitter bread of prescription the fable of the fox and the flies might here possibly occur to the reader i however prefer to remember lucero's fable of the tree called montevideo with the chattering colony in its branches and to look upon myself as one in the majestic bovine army about to besiege the monkeys and punish them for their naughty behaviour quite early in the morning we had breakfast then every man was ordered to saddle his best horse for every one of us was the owner of three or four steeds i of course saddled the horse the general had given me which had been reserved for important work we mounted and proceeded at a gentle pace through a very wild and broken country still in the direction of the cachilla about midday scouts came riding in and reported that the enemy were close upon us after halting for half an hour we again proceeded at the same gentle pace till about two o'clock when we crossed the cañada de san paulo a deep valley beyond which the plain rose to a height of about one hundred and fifty feet in the cañada we stopped to water our horses and there heard that the enemy were advancing along it at a rapid pace evidently hoping to cut off our supposed retreat towards the cachilla crossing the little stream of san paulo we began slowly ascending the sloping plain on the farther side till the highest point was gained then turning we saw the enemy 
numbering about seven hundred men beneath us, spread out in a line of extraordinary length. Up from the valley they came towards us at a brisk trot. We were then rapidly disposed in three columns, the centre one numbering about two hundred and fifty men, the others about two hundred men each. I was in one of the outside columns, within about four men from the front. My fellow soldiers, who had hitherto been very light-hearted and chatty, had suddenly become grave and quiet, some of them even looking pale and scared. On one side of me was an irrepressible scamp of boy, about eighteen years old, a dark little fellow with a monkey face and a feeble falsetto voice like a very old woman. I watched him take out a small, sharp knife, and without looking down, draw it across the upper part of his surcingle three or four times. But this he did evidently only for practice, as he did not cut into the hide. Seeing me watching, he grinned mysteriously, and made a sign with head and shoulders thrust forward in imitation of a person riding away at full speed, after which he restored his knife to its sheath. "'You intend cutting your surcingle and running away, little coward,' I said. "'And what are you going to do?' he returned. "'Fight,' I said. "'It is the best thing you can do, Sir Frenchman,' said he with a grin. "'Listen,' I said, "'when the fight is over, I will look you up to thrash you for your impertinence in calling me a Frenchman. After the fight, he exclaimed with a funny grimace. Do you mean next year, before that distant time arrives, some Colorado will fall in love with you, and, and, and... Here he explained himself without words, by drawing the edge of his hand briskly across his throat then closing his eyes and making gurgling sounds, supposed to be uttered by a person undergoing the painful operation of having his throat cut. Our colloquy was carried on in whispers, but his pantomimic performance drew on us the attention of our neighbors, and now he looked round to inform them with a grin and a nod that his oriental wit was getting the victory. I was determined not to be put down by him, however, and tapped my revolver with my hand to call his attention to it. Look at this, you young miscreant, I said. Do you not know that I and many others in this column have received orders from the general to shoot down every man who attempts to run away? This speech effectually silenced him. He turned as pale as his dark skin would let him and looked round like a hunted animal in search of a hole to hide in. On my other hand, a grisly-bearded old goucher in somewhat tattered garments lit a cigarette, and oblivious of everything except the stimulating fragrance of the strongest black tobacco, expanded his lungs with long inspirations to send forth thereafter clouds of blue smoke into his neighbors' faces, scattering the soothing perfume over a third portion of the army. Santa Coloma rose equal to the occasion. Swiftly riding from column to column, he addressed each in turn, and using the quaint, expressive phraseology of the gauchos, which he knew so well, poured forth his denunciations of the Colorados with a fury and eloquence that brought the blood with a rush to many of his followers' pale cheeks. They were traitors, plunderers, assassins, he cried. They had committed a million crimes, but all these things were nothing, nothing compared with that one black crime which no other political party had been guilty of. By the aid of Brazilian gold, and Brazilian bayonets, they had risen to power. 
they were the infamous pensioners of the empire of slaves. He compared them to the man who marries a beautiful wife and sells her to some rich person so as to live luxuriously on the wages of his own dishonour. The foul stain which they had brought on the honour of the Banda Oriental could only be washed away with their blood. Pointing to the advancing troops, he said that when those miserable hirelings were scattered like thistle down before the wind, the entire country would be with him, and the Banda Oriental after half a century of degradation, free at last and for ever from the Brazilian curse. Waving his sword, he galloped back to the front of his column, greeted by a storm of vivas. Then a great silence fell upon our ranks, while up the slope, their trumpets sounding merrily, trotted the enemy, till they had covered about three hundred yards of the ascending ground, threatening to close us round in an immense circle, when suddenly the order was given to charge, and, led by Santa Coloma, we thundered down the incline upon them. Soldiers reading this plain, unvarnished account of an oriental battle might feel inclined to criticize Santa Coloma's tactics for his men were, like the Arabs, horsemen and little else. They were, moreover, armed with lance and broadsword, weapons requiring a great deal of space to be used effectively. Yet, considering all the circumstances, I am sure that he did the right thing. He knew that he was too weak to meet the enemy in the usual way, pitting man against man, also, that if he failed to fight, his temporary prestige would vanish like smoke and the rebellion collapse. Having decided to hazard all, and knowing that in a stand-up fight he would infallibly be beaten, his only plan was to show a bold front, mass his feeble followers together in columns, and hurl them upon the enemy hoping by this means to introduce a panic amongst his opponents and so snatch the victory. A discharge of carbines with which we were received did us no damage. I, at any rate, saw no saddles emptied near me, and in a few moments we were dashing through the advancing lines. A shout of triumph went up from our men for our cowardly foes were flying before us in all directions. On we rode in triumph till we reached the bottom of the hill. Then we reined up, for before us was the stream of San Paolo, and the few scattered men who had crossed it and were scuttling away like hunted ostriches scarcely seemed worth chasing. Suddenly, with a great shout, a large body of colorados came thundering down the hill on our rear and flank, and dismay seized upon us. The feeble efforts made by some of our officers to bring us round to face them proved unavailing. I am utterly unable to give any clear account of what followed immediately after that, for we were all friends and foes, mixed up for some minutes in the wildest confusion, and how I ever got out of it all without a scratch is a mystery to me. More than once I was in violent collision with Colorado men, distinguished from ours by their uniform, and several furious blows with sword and lance were aimed at me, but somehow I escaped them all. I emptied the six chambers of my Colt's revolver, but whether my bullets did any execution or not, I cannot pretend to say. In the end, I found myself surrounded by four of our men who were furiously spurring their horses out of the fight. "'Whip up, Captain! Come with us this way!' shouted one of them who knew me, and who always insisted on giving me a title to which I had no right. 
as we rode away, skirting the hill towards the south, he assured me that all was lost, in proof of which he pointed the scattered bodies of our men flying from the field in all directions. Yes, we were defeated, that was plain to see, and I needed little encouragement from my fellow runaways to spur my horse to its utmost speed. Had the falcon eye of Santa Coloma rested on me at that moment, he might have added to the list of oriental traits he had given me the un-English faculty of knowing when I was beaten. I was quite as anxious, I believe, to save my skin, throat, we say in the Banda Oriental, as any horseman there, not even excepting the monkey-faced boy with the squeaky voice. If the curious reader, thirsting for knowledge, will consult the Uruguayan histories, I dare say he will find a more scientific description of the Battle of San Paulo than I have been able to give. My excuse must be that it was the only battle, pitched or other, at which I have ever assisted. Also, that my position in the Blanco forces was a very humble one. Altogether, I am not over-proud of my soldiering performances. Still, as I did no worse than Frederick the Great of Prussia, who ran away from his first battle, I do not consider that I need blush furiously. My companions took our defeat with the usual oriental resignation. You see, said one in explanation of his mental attitude, there must always be one side defeated in every fight, for had we gained the day, then the Colorados would have lost. There was in this remark a sound, practical philosophy. It could not be controverted. It burdened our brains with no new thing, and it made us all very cheerful. For myself, I did not care very much, but could not help thinking a great deal of Dolores who would now have a fresh grief to increase her pain. For a distance of three or four miles, we rode at a fast gallop on the slopes of the Cachilla, paused to breathe our horses, and dismounting, stood for some time, gazing back over the wide landscape spread out before us. At our backs rose the giant green and brown walls of the Sierras, the range stretching away on either hand in violet and deep blue masses. At our feet lay the billowy green and yellow plain, vast as ocean, and channeled by innumerable streams, while one black patch on a slope far away showed us that our foes were camping on the very spot where they had overcome us. Not a cloud appeared in the immense heavens, only, low down in the west, purple and rose-colored vapors were beginning to form, staining the clear, intense, white-blue sky about the sinking sun. Over all reigned deep silence, until suddenly a flock of orange and flame-colored orioles with black wings swept down on a clump of bushes hard by, and poured forth a torrent of wild, joyous music. A strange performance. Screaming notes that seemed to scream jubilant gladness to listening heaven, and notes abrupt and guttural, mingling with others more clear and soul-piercing than ever human lips drew from reed or metal. It soon ended. Up sprang the vocalists like a fountain of fire and fled away to their roost among the hills. Then silence reigned once more. What brilliant hues! What gay, fantastic music! Were they indeed birds? Were the glad, winged inhabitants of a mystic region resembling earth, but sweeter than earth? and never entered by death, upon whose threshold I had stumbled by chance. 
then while the last rich flood of sunshine came over the earth from that red everlasting urn resting on the far horizon i could had i been alone have cast myself upon the ground to adore the great god of nature who had given me this precious moment of life for here the religion that languishes in crowded cities or steals shamefaced to hide itself in dim churches flourishes greatly filling the soul with a solemn joy face to face with nature on the vast hills at eventide who does not feel himself near to the unseen out of his heart god shall not pass his image stamped is on every grass my comrades anxious to get through the kachia were already on horseback shouting to me to mount one more lingering glance over that wide prospect wide yet how small a portion of the banda's twenty thousand miles of everlasting verdure watered by innumerable beautiful streams again the thought of dolores swept like a moaning wind over my heart for this rich prize her beautiful country how weakly and with what feeble hands had we striven where now was her hero the glorious deliverer perseus lying perhaps stark and stained with blood on yon darkening moor not yet was the colorado monster overcome rest on thy rock andromeda i sadly murmured then leaping into the saddle galloped away after my retreating comrades already half a mile away down in the shadowy mountain pass End of chapter 18